Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Decker Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And I feel great. Really great. Nothing in the world can bring me down. As you may remember, last week I reviewed Black Dawn, a 2005 sequel to the 2002 Seagal movie called The Foreigner. As I hadn't reviewed The Foreigner yet, that got dumped in my lap as the next project to undertake. And you know what the best part is? Amazon's shipping's been delayed! The DVD hasn't arrived yet! I simply can't review the movie this week! <sighs> Thank you all for watching, I'm Decker Shadow, and remember, I will review The Foreigner next week. Hey, Decker, it's me. Oh. Hey, James, what's going on? Well, I thought something was going on. You know. All summer long. Yeah, it'll be back next week. Don't worry. No, 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 Decker. You can't just skip a week. Whether you like it or not, right now, it's the summer of Steven Seagal. Where did you learn to do that? Uh, that's, that's irrelevant. The point is, Decker, that I know you, okay? You can't run away from this. It's just not your style. Just think about it, man, okay? Schmuck. Well, this is a bit out of place, but how about Out for Justice? Another one of Seagal's profitable theatrical releases from the early 90s, Out for Justice stars him as the best ever NYPD detective with a checkered past who must seek revenge for his fallen comrade in Seagal action movie style. That is to say, completely ignoring police procedure and killing as many people as possible. Well, sounds more entertaining than The Foreigner, anyway. So, let's take a look at Out for Justice and... Damn postal service. We open with a quote from Arthur Miller, you know, to prepare you for the amazingly poetic experience of a Seagal movie. Such as when we cut to a confrontation between a hooker and her pimp. What? Yo, bitch, I don't work for the phone company, I don't do this shit on business, bring your motherfucking ass here. Eh, pimping lacks a capacity to be described as low in resistance, but it has a required presence. Seagal just so happens to be nearby with his partner Bobby, played by Jay Acavone. Bobby tells him to ignore the street violence as they are there to intercept a three million dollar deal. Naturally, Seagal ignores this, completely fucking any chance of catching said deal in the act, and instead saves a prostitute from a series of pimp slaps so she can whore herself out in peace. Who the fuck you think you are, huh? You like to beat up on fucking women, is that it? Actually, at least one of Seagal's wives filed complaints that he... Oh, wow. This just got really awkward. But in movies, he's a hero, and proceeds to assault a man already in police custody, which rewards him with the title screen. Oh, you're wondering about that three million dollar hit that Seagal fucked the police out of stopping? Never brought up again. Instead, we go to our bad guy of this tale, Richie, played by William Forsythe. He establishes his three goons, including Robert Lissardo again, who will be staying with him in hopes of receiving massive monetary compensation by morning. No reason to let Act 2 wait in this movie anymore, it seems, as Richie teleports to Bobby as he's out with his family and blows him away. I 
the feel, huh, Bobby? Feels like there wasn't an Act 1 outside of the opening credits. You know, first a quote, then in medias res. Uh, you do realize you're making a Seagal movie, right? What are you on, crack? Okay, then. He's sure to shoot a woman before leaving his car behind and just walking. Don't worry, the cops are incredibly ineffective in this movie. But this is extra bad for poor old Seagal. He was gonna play ball with his son! Bobby Lupo's been shot on 18th Avenue. In front of his wife and kids. Oh my god. I'm sending your car. What? Two people who were barely on screen were killed, and now his son, who we never saw before, is upset. Am I supposed to care about any of this? You didn't establish anything about anyone! There was no Act 1! Seagal shows up in the scene with... Um... Uh, a beret. Whatever. His highly questionable fashion sense aside, we then meet... Sure you want to see this? Jerry Orbach! Uh, no, no. Law and order, not Seagal films. Law and order, not Seagal films. Anyway, Jerry plays Captain Ronnie Dunzinger, who seems less a captain and more of a detective, as we pretty much never see him anywhere but on the streets investigating. Never mind that, not wasting any time as he rushes forward in Act 2, Seagal convinces his convenient captain to outfit him with an unmarked vehicle and a shotgun so he can complete his hero's journey. Just so you know, we're only ten minutes into the movie. But just because they started not only with action, but the main action of the story, that doesn't mean it's not a terrible idea to randomly cut away to introduce us to a shit ton of characters who are so minor, I honestly could completely omit the scene and it would make no difference. Richie had ties to the mob, and they want him dead for making them look bad. That's pretty much it. They're almost never in the scenes in this movie, and when they are, they don't do anything. They try to play off that they may be important players in the events to come as they stop to chat with Seagal, switching between Italian and English every other line so twice as many people can eavesdrop on their conversation, but establish merely that they want Richie dead and are no threat to Seagal. God forbid I find this guy before you do. You know what I'm gonna do. Dios arch. Dios arch. Hmm, wouldn't happen to be break all the bones in his body in a long confrontation scene that leaves him completely covered in blood and you relatively unharmed, would it? Never mind the plot, though. We've got something far more important to take care of. That is pretty fucked up. Okay, hop in the car, chase the bastard down, and deliver justice Seagal style. Please, God. Let me run into this guy someday. What? Your car's right there! Come on, hop in and step on the gas! No sleep till! Or you can forget about that and just go into a montage. A quick drive by a young boy so we know who he is when he shows up an hour later, and we get to see what Richie's up to, hiring some random goons. How about you, Paulie? You got the fucking balls? Yeah, I got the balls. Now you got the bread. Uh, shouldn't you pay them after they've administered their services for you? This transaction summons Seagal and a chase scene ensues as Richie takes the street and Seagal takes the stairs. Anyway, they narrowly escape with the help of a very apathetic truck driver. Hey, get the fuck out of the way! Oh, don't go yelling at him. Seagal, I know you could have just leaned out the window and pushed the truck aside. Somehow, despite the fact that they escaped, that doesn't mean they escaped, as they are certain Seagal is right on their tail. So they stop at a local meat market for a bit. Here he is. I want you to hang this motherfucker up on a hook. Do you hear me, Frankie? Oh, a market that the mob happens to be dealing drugs from! And who doesn't mind taking orders from Richie despite the higher-ups wanting him dead? How convenient! They easily put some distance between themselves and Seagal, as they knew he couldn't resist ignoring the reason behind this chase, seeing to instead beat a few miscellaneous goons' asses as thoroughly as possible. Ah, ah shit. Ah, it's for you, motherfucker! Oh, Don't be a bad guy. Ah, what do you want to shoot me for? Ah, Don't be a bad guy like that. Be a nice guy, right? So that's his secret. Seagal is only ever attacked by the most idiotic and ineffective criminals in all of New York. A short transition to establish that the mob wants Richie dead. Again. 
And it's more of Seagal and the Puppy, who, if these scenes are anything to go by, he cares about more than his son. Suddenly, however, some of the Mafia's general managers show up, chatting a bit with Seagal to establish that he's a cop. Real important information there. But it's just a segue so we can watch this group of hardened criminals track down Richie's brother instantaneously to perform their version of an investigation. You find them, otherwise the next time we come back here, you're coming with us. Get out of here. That is to say, one where they gather no information and accomplish nothing. But hey, keeps them busy. Never mind that manhunt, or investigation, or anything really, as Seagal stops by Richie's parents' house to chat. That might sound like an investigation, but... Come on, if Richie had been here, they'd be dead. You know something that I don't know. You better tell me. When I came here, I got a job at repairing the subway. And, uh, how is this relevant? Simple. It isn't. Just establishing that he's got ties to Richie's folks, and they're good people and yada yada yada, another unnecessary scene. Moving on, Richie barges into a former prostitute's home because he just so happened to know where she lived, and establishes to the audience that he is a heartless bastard who doesn't care about other people at all, as if the string of murders wasn't a big enough clue. Of course, you need lots of clues when it turns out Seagal's investigation is so far behind, he's barely caught up to the same place and the same questions as the monsters from a couple scenes ago. And you know why he's not here? Why? Because he's a chicken shit fucking pussy asshole, you know? And knowing he wouldn't be there, and you would most likely learn nothing from showing up, why did you bother including this location as part of your investigation? Oh, it's so he can shove people around, break things left and right, making sure the audience understands he's by far the biggest prick in the whole movie, and then proceed to beat the ever-loving fuck out of all the people in the bar! Because a Seagal movie just isn't complete without at least one or two bar fights. Get up, Jack! Come on, man! Come on! Come on! Come on! Get in the Get in Go! Go! Focus fucking eye out! Focus fucking eye out! Which is a lot less exciting when they decided for some reason to just not have music in most of their action sequences. After breaking the man's arm and nose, the investigation is back in order. Sort of. Don't ask me what these scenes have to do with anything, it's all done in another musical montage. So you obviously do have a soundtrack, and not a bad one for a movie from 1991, and instead of using it for your action scenes, you decide to obscure your investigations with it. Maybe there's a good reason for that, as next we're told that, hey, the Mafia wants Richie dead. Still. And they talk to Seagal, again, about his old ties with them. Again. Well, fuck this plot stuck on repeat, let's go to Richie crashing into another random Mafia-owned spot in the city, on the same night, so he's a really busy guy. Teleport back to Seagal, and his random method of investigation has led him to a club owned by Richie's sister, Patty, played by Gina Gershon. As she has no information to share with him, he bullies his way into her private office, tearing the place apart like an asshole, until eventually he does find something. This is a year in jail. Sullivan Act. A year! Actually, uh, that's nothing. Legally, anyway, you can't just barge in and search without a warrant, and even if you do find anything on an unwarranted police search, it's inadmissible in court. Didn't Jerry Orbach teach you anything? Fuck legal procedure or citizens' rights or anything like that while Seagal's around. No, the best way to progress your investigation is framing innocent women! Jack, did you ever find this one over here on the street? Many times. And how much was she? Ten bucks. Oh, ten yeah. bucks, this Fuck. friend! Hey, ten's not that bad. Should do it for ten bucks. Ten bucks each or ten bucks for all of us? Ten bucks each. What do you think? She's some cheap hooker? At this point, the police have tracked Ricky down to his hideaway in the car factory. No, there were no leads. It's just it's been a while since the last action scene, so hey, confrontation! Or just an excuse to uproot them, as nearly immediately we switch to Seagal finally thinking, hey, we're 53 minutes into the movie, maybe we should look in Bobby's desk! Wouldn't you know it, it just so happens to be full of incriminating evidence. Yep. Biggest break in the case, and he's keeping it to himself. Of course. Richie's dad shows up at random to remind Seagal about his past and ties to Richie. Again. And we're back with Richie and gang, who, as luck would have it, now has a police scanner in their arsenal. Your wife's called a couple of times. She's over at your apartment with Tony. Any chance you could swing over there for a minute? Yeah, and, uh... I could do that. I'm, I'm right in the area. 
good thing he got that police scanner in time. You know, wouldn't want a Seagal movie to end without at least one plot point driven by nothing but stupid coincidence. <laughs> I almost forgot about you. I almost forgot about you. The damn dog's been in your car the whole time? Fucking hey, didn't you even notice the shit he took on your floorboards? That's not new car smell. But the cute puppy and stench of fecal matter charms his ex-wife to completely forget about their divorce agreement. You wanna come up for an espresso? Yeah. Why not? There's one thing that video games have taught me. Seagal's gonna have to press X at the right intervals for about two minutes, and they're going to be fully clothed. Which we don't even see, as instead we skip right to Seagal killing the mood by telling us all about his sad past and ties with Richie. Again. Do you know these may be your streets in your neighborhood? But there are other police officers. Yeah, but none of them are played by Steven Seagal. But Tony needs a father. I need a husband. If you need a husband, then what did you divorce him for? Seriously, we don't know. They skipped over that part, like the rest of the character building. Of course he agrees, and they fall in love. Again, though for the first time in this movie. And right on cue, Richie's army of goons attack. Where he got them from, I don't know, but he must be doing pretty good for himself, as from the three he started with, Seagal kills six of them. Oh, wait, the Mafia's still in this movie as they come back to the bar. Again. To question Richie's little brother. Again which results in learning nothing and leaving yet again. Seriously, how fast do the writers just run out of ideas and start copying and pasting for scenes in this movie? Next thing, we see Seagal heading over to the club owned by Richie's sister to investigate and... God damn it! Oh, but actually this time he does get a sliver more information for the case as the waitress recognizes the woman in the photo, allowing Seagal to find an address with the power of the Rolodex. Uh, uh, Seagal? I don't know if you noticed, but she just sat on your puppy. Richie, however, has finally showed up at the bar. Don't know when he got the memo that he was supposed to be there, but never mind that. One of the wandering Mafia troops are coming by around the same time, which means they can finally do something in this scene. Next, Seagal finds Bobby's girlfriend, Roxanne, who also happened to be Richie's girlfriend, and also happens to be dead. He lets the waitress sit on the puppy a little more to calm down, and tells Orbach what he discovered. Now, from the extreme remoteness in the body, it looks to me like, uh, I would say, time of death 24 hours ago, before Bobby. No, I'm not surprised in the slightest that Seagal just so happens to be an expert on forensics as well. Richie returns to random former hooker's home, but wouldn't you know it, kid from an hour ago who we never thought about this whole movie happens to see him and is sure to call the authorities. You don't need a quarter to dial 911. While Richie is preparing for the climax by calling out for hooker delivery, Seagal decides to instead piece together what excuse for story this movie has, as Bobby being murdered because he's a sick piece of drug-dealing, girlfriend-stealing shit is too simple, and it must be his wife's fault as she found the Polaroids of her husband fucking Roxanne and mailed them to Richie. I didn't want to kill him, I just wanted to save my marriage, Gino. You didn't kill him. And who cares if you did? All we learned about him all movie is that he was fucking scum. Why are they trying to shift the blame to his wife? What, did she cause him to have affairs and deal drugs, too? Now Seagal gets a call from the kid, and he can leave this movie for good. No reason for anyone to get in the way of Seagal's climax. Sneaking in unnoticed, he wastes this advantage by walking right up to them. Hands on the fucking table. Jesus, what the fuck's going on? Seagal got shot? Oh, wow, I don't think that I ever... Uh, wait, does this even matter? Of course not, as he isn't slowed down in the slightest, taking out tons of thugs with his pump-action shotgun that, conveniently enough, requires no pumping. Oh! 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 Oh, no! Interestingly enough, the blown-off leg was one of the scenes cut from the theatrical version in the European release. You know, because it was a little too violent. I gotta love America for that. I only have to worry about censoring the scenes if they show something really damaging to child's minds. Like naked people. Fuck you, cop! 
And then, I don't mean to say that I'm better than Hollywood or anything, but I could have choreographed that fight a bit more exciting. But it's finally down to Richie and Seagal. In a complete freak turn of events that no one could have possibly seen coming, the entire fight is nothing but Richie flailing around ineffectively, while Seagal continuously beats on him, getting in bloodier and bloodier, turning every weapon back against him, until he finally tries to defeat Seagal with... a corkscrew. That's for Bobby. Why? Bobby was an asshole! And Richie was going for suicide by cop, so you gave him what he wanted. Congratulations, you completely fucked up any chance of having a meaningful ending, Seagal. Oh, wait, he does shoot the corpse a couple times with a friendly random mafia's gun, so they can go back and say they did their job. After all, Richie dead by any other means wouldn't be any good, right? Therefore, happy ending. Seagal has his wife back, a puppy, and that damn Bray again. But wait. It's the animal abuser. Okay, time to take him in and find out what devious acts he's involved in that would lead him to throw a puppy out of a car window in a trash bag. My balls! Okay, now that you've gotten being a violent prick out of the way, now it's time to arrest him and find out what he's doing that... Oh, Vic! Look over here, is that a police dog or what? <laughs> okay, <laughs> never mind. Injure and mildly inconvenience him and ignore the underlying cause completely. Well, that was out for justice. And it's kind of like a fluffernutter. You know, without bread. Or peanut butter. It's kind of ironic that this is the movie I pulled out to fill the week while waiting for another movie to arrive, because as it turns out, the whole movie is nothing but filler anyway. It tries to pretend like there's some deep interwoven plot with the pacing, constantly switching back and forth between Seagal, the Mafia, and Richie, but the actual story is so bare-bones they're just running around like chickens with their heads cut off for most of the movie. And Medias Res can be a useful tool for getting to the action as quickly as possible, but because it leaves no time for character development, the death of a friend means next to nothing to the viewer. He wasn't our friend. That was the second scene he was in, and he had, what, five lines? It's somehow made worse when they finally answer the question of just what he was shot for in the first place. It's nice to actually have a reason that makes sense, but it means that your fallen buddy's most distinctive character traits are that he was a lying, drug-dealing, lecherous asshole. Not feeling too bad on seeing him go now. It does make Richie's motivation for killing him clear, but his desire to end his own life is a bit harder to believe. The tons of crack he smokes help make up for that, except for the fact that anyone smoking that amount in a 24-hour period likely wouldn't need a cop to kill them off. But here's the real kicker. Hardly any scenes in this movie had anything to do with the so-called story at hand. You've got Seagal having repetitive conversations with people who contribute nothing to the overall events, a subplot with a dog that looks like it got shoehorned in at the last minute, and half a dozen interrogations of people who have nothing to say. If you cut all the extraneous bullshit out of the film, its running time would be less than 20 minutes. So, is there something to like? Here and there, the action's normal Seagal fare, nothing too spectacular, but entertaining. The music is pretty good too, at least in how well it reminds you that this was certainly made in the early 90s, and aside from Seagal's horrid attempt at a Brooklyn accent, the acting is decent all around. It's still a decidedly below-average movie, though, coming in at two kicks to the groin out of five. Hey, does that mean if it was awesome I would have given it five kicks to the groin? Hmm. Maybe I didn't think that one through. Anyway, thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, don't run away from responsibility or it'll just keep itching at you on the back of your neck. Wait, no, shit, that's a tick.
I'm getting too old for this shit, Gino.